going on, everyone, and welcome back into the epic podcast, Philosophical Differences. Brendan Schaefer, Josh Jacobs, talking St. Louis Cardinals. Baseball, Josh, how are you today? Uh, Cardinals couldn't pull off that sweep against the Rays, but they did get the series win. Yeah, I mean, I'm good today. The Cardinals probably aren't feeling that great. But at the same time, it's like uh, we were talking, joking about it a little bit pre-show. Like, it just feels like the feeling around the team keeps changing every single game. And like, I mean, you the pull off the sweep last night. And I think we're having a lot of different conversations today. Still got a series win against a pretty good club in the Tampa Bay Rays. So um, I don't think they should feel I don't I did maybe leave a li- with a little bit of a bad taste in their mouth after that game. But you should, should still be mostly encouraged by pulling off a series win after what was a really tough weekend. Yeah, and, and honestly, they didn't play badly in the, no. the loss to the Rays in Game 3. They just didn't. I mean, look, we knew the bullpen was going to be a little bit tricky, having used Helsley and Kittredge both in, in Games 1 and 2 of the series. They they got those wins in part because of the performances of those guys down the stretch. And, and then you just need other relievers, I think, is really what it boils down to. That is not really something the Cardinals can control anymore. Maybe they get Riley O'Brien back and he becomes a leverage option for them. But the, the trade deadline was the point at which to do something about that and You know, it remains to be seen whether they did enough. They added Sean Armstrong, but obviously he wasn't in for that spot last night when it counted. It was Kyle Leahy. So we'll kind of see what it looks like beyond those top four. I still feel like the Cardinals and and Ollie Marmel looking to find some other relievers they can rely upon. But just generally speaking right now, Cardinals, you know, the division is they're fading in the division. They're seven back, I believe, this morning. It's not like it's unreachable because you do play the Brewers six more times this year. So if you're going to win the division, it's going to happen because you perform really, really well against Milwaukee in those six games. You might need five out of the six to really be able to flip things around. Um, But the wild card still very much within reach for the Cardinals. But with the fact that they spent most of the season and fans were kind of used to them being on the the right side of that wild card cut line, and now they're two and a half games out. uh, What are we thinking about the way that this race is playing out? There's still a lot of time left in the season. But like you said, because of a loss last night, it almost single-handedly on one day on a dime flips people back from, you know, feeling suddenly good again, Cardinals playing well against the Rays, to kind of like they felt maybe Monday when they lose to the Mets and over the past weekend at Wrigley. Uh, what's your view of kind of what where the Cardinals fit into this race and, and what could be ahead over the next eight weeks? I mean, personally, I still feel like they're very much in the race, right? I mean, you're two and a half games back with about eight weeks left in the season. And we just, it feels like every other week there's a new, there's at least one different wild card team than there was the week before. The Braves have finally faded out of a spot since the season ended today. The Braves are missing the playoffs now. They're all, they're half game out. The Cardinals are two and a half games out. The Giants are three games out, but then you've got the Mets, Diamondbacks, and Padres in the race. Um, I feel pretty confident about the Padres being a playoff team at this point, but even then, I mean, they just have a two and a half game lead in the wild card right now. So they, I mean, we could see something fade with them at some point. Um, but I feel like you're right in the mix for two spots with the Diamondbacks, Mets, Braves, and Giants. And you've got the lead on the Giants right now. You're barely back at the Braves. You're again, you're two and a half games back of the Mets right now. I think my main takeaway is we just need to see more happen. I mean, if this club goes on like a, a, a horrid stretch where they win three of their next like nine or 12 or 10 or something like that, then yeah, you could create some gaps here, but that could also happen to the Mets. It could also happen to the diamondbacks. If the Mets go and win 15 of their next 20, like that creates a lot of separation. And it's, that's something like the Cardinals could be playing pretty well, but they're not keeping pace with the Mets. And we just don't know what's going to happen. And it's been so unpredictable. It's been so wishy-washy. It's been so kind of hit or miss, depending on like the Mets have looked terrible at times and they look great at times. The Diamondbacks have looked terrible at times and they've looked great at times. We've had t- conversations or we're talking about, can the Cardinals be the second best team in the national league for a little bit? Now we're like, Oh, are they even going to make the playoffs? I just think there's so much variance right now that to call the club, uh, to car- call the Cardinals a playoff team right now would be way too optimistic because we just don't know if that's going to happen. But to declare the season dead when they're two and a half games out and have, I just, th- I think they've continuously shown they can fight to get back into things, right? Like you can go back to that May 11th when they had every reason to roll over and call the season over and they went on a stretch run there. Um, they've had a couple different moments in July where it's like, okay, things seem to be teetering and then they kind of get it back on track a little bit. Can they go on another, maybe not run like they did since Mother's Day to the All-Star break, but can they go a sustained stretch where they're six games above, above 500? I can see that. Could they also go six games below under uh, below 500 for a sustained stretch? I could also see that. But I can see that with the Mets, the Diamondbacks, the Braves, the Giants. And so that's where I'm at a space right now where it's actually kind of, it feels to me like it's going to be a really fun race down to the end. And unless one or two of these teams totally implodes or runs with it, we're probably going to see a game or two separation of all these teams coming down to the last week of the season. 
Yeah, when you look at the schedule, too, you can kind of paint one of two narratives. You can say, wow, the Cardinals have a tough schedule coming up. Like that, This might not be possible for them to sustain the level of play that will be needed to close a gap on the wild card teams ahead of them. Or you could say you're playing some of those teams. You're playing quality opponents that you're chasing. I mean, you get the Brewers coming up. You get the Padres for four at home uh, toward the end of this month. So, like, there are opportunities against some of the teams that you'll be chasing. And, and they, again, they still have six against the Brewers. Yeah. Three this month, um, three coming up in, in early September. So those are going to be opportunities if you want to view it that way. The other side of it is, though, like, against tough competition, did the Cardinals do enough against the lull in their schedule that we kind of saw to be able to build themselves a cushion? Well, obviously no, because they're they're kind of coming into this tougher stretch where they are now outside looking in in terms of a playoff spot. So that is something that can be concerning. It was kind of the thought process of build a cushion and then hold on to it down the stretch. It's going to have to go the other way. They're going to have to try and claw out of the deficit that they're currently in, and it's going to have to come against some quality opponents. I guess the question a lot of people would have, and look, some people are, are putting it out there as a declarative statement more so than a question. Like the Cardinals don't have enough to be able to do that against this type of competition coming up. And for me, it's like, what's going to carry them? I continue to ask the question yeah. of what's going to be the thing that can carry the Cardinals to the promised land of 87, 88 wins and being able to get them into a postseason berth. Uh, is it going to be the, the, the starting rotation? Like probably not. They're kind of middle of the pack as a rotation. I feel pretty good about them being a stable unit at this point. And, you know, for all the, the hand-wringing that we saw about Eric Fetty after his Wrigley Field start, I thought he actually performed pretty well against the Rays and gave the Cardinals just what they needed. Five innings, one run. Look, you might like your starters to get through six, but then it's like you're always going to want a little bit more. Last night with Kyle Gibson, it was people saying, you're, the real starters need to go through you know, and get through seven innings. So, well, yeah, it'd be nice, but you are you get through five, six, and, and sometimes seven with some of these guys and do it with the Cardinals either in the lead or, or right there in a close game. That feels like the way the rotation was built out. The reality is the offense is supposed to be the unit, I think, with how this roster was constructed before the year, that you know John Mozeliak spent all of his effort and energy in the offseason adding starting pitching because it's, it, they were terrible last year, and it was a clear deficit for the team. Offensively, they were kind of mid last year, but we had reasons to believe that they could improve for a competitive team that down the stretch wasn't putting everybody on the IL because they had a hangnail. They were, you know, this would be the team that would get together, be a little more healthy and have the talent one through nine to be able to compete and probably be not only like a top half offense, but a legitimate top 10 offense in major league baseball. Yeah. They're like 21st, 22nd in these key offensive categories at this point. To me, do they have the offense to be able to sustain because the rotation's done its job. It's been exactly as we thought it would before the season. The, the bullpen has maybe exceeded. I know last night you look and say, oh, the bullpen. And it's like, I feel like these lazy narratives come out where Cardinals fans say, oh, it's the same old story. You, you get a lead and you can't hold it. It's like, what are you talking about? You have the closer with uh, who, is, who has saved more games than anybody in Major League Baseball this season. Three of the blown saves he's had. Well, he's the winning pitcher in two of them. So it's not like this, this narrative. The Cardinals are always this team that, oh, they can't hold a lead late. Come on. Every Major League Baseball team is going to have some blown late leads. And last night, was a night where you could have absolutely predicted it would have come because they knew they weren't going to have their their best foot to put forward uh, in terms of the, the bullpen guys that they were going to have at their disposal available to pitch. So I, I don't think that's really a fair characterization. Are there questions of the bullpen? Sure. But I think it's largely been exactly the unit you could have hoped for it to be, especially if you would have been told preseason, you're not going to get an inning from Keenan Middleton. You're going to have to, you know, and, and Riley O'Brien, who you really were excited about in spring. Yeah, he's not going to, he's going to throw a game uh, pre-August, and you're maybe going to get him at the end of the year. We'll see. So knowing all of those factors, I think the bullpen has performed exactly as you'd hope. Same for the rotation. Where's the offense, and can that be the unit that carries them? Because, look, if the offense suddenly becomes a top-10 unit the rest of the way, I think the Cardinals probably make the playoffs because I trust the pitching enough with what the way they built it out. That was It's going as designed. The offense is still not going as designed, but this deep into the season, can we do we have reason to believe that it can become that unit that was promised, or is it just going to be a middling group that you know from time to time they're going to get their their hits with risk, but usually they're they're just going to struggle in that category, or you know home runs they're they're not going to have a, a big power threat. I mean, I get it. Gorman's hit some homers, Burley's hit some homers, but the the consistency of the long ball has not been coming from the sources you thought there would be. So I guess that's just sort of my thought right now. Do they have enough in any one area to be able to lift them over some of these other teams down the stretch when they're playing tough competition? I, I think it's a fair question. Yeah, it for sure is. But I think to your point too, we can harp on the bullpen a little bit too much when it occasionally breaks because 
Unless you're the, what was the stat last night? The Rays had only like there were 45 and like one or something when they were leading after eight innings or something like that. It was wild. So it's like, and even Tampa fans will be like, oh, this bullpen, like the one time yeah. they blew it, that's just baseball fans, right? I, we get yeah. that. Yeah. And it didn't, they didn't say anything about how many times because they could have blown some games and then come back and won. It's like all those things. But the Cardinals have five relievers right now with a 3.08 ERA or lower. And if you told me that going into the year, I'd be like, this bullpen, it, like you can't ask for anything more than that. I know it's been shakier as of late. And that, to your point, it's something we need to watch. But I can't blame the bullpen. Uh, preseason expectations. Again, this is what I was hoping for the rotation is that it's like a good enough or maybe average enough is the better way to say it to keep you in games. And Honestly, if, if the if Eric Fetty they got against the Rays is more of the Eric Fetty they're going to get going forward, I think you actually feel a little bit better about the rotation down the stretch. Again, he had one blow up start, but then if you could get Gray, his last two starts has looked more like Sonny Gray again. But if you can have two straight starts every week where it's Sonny Gray and Eric Fetty who really can win you a game rather than just keep you in a game, and then you have Gibson, Michaelis, and Polante or whatever it is from there, feel better about the rotation. The offense, it's if you, I'm a WRC plus guy, they're 11th in baseball against right handed pitching this year. So, like, again, that's underachieving a bit, but it the, the hitting against right handed pitching really isn't like there's some room for improvement, but you can already see it there. It's the left handed pitching stuff all over again, right? And you even look at like Goldie's been one of their better performers against left handed pitching, but it's like, okay, but when it matters the most, is he going to produce? You don't really trust it right now. We can talk about Arenado, he's be heating up lately, and maybe that's part of the key to this. But I do think if there's like an area where they could, I, to your point, I don't know if there's a, a unit that you can call a true strength that can carry them. I think this bullpen is really good, but I don't know if it's good enough to they carry. Buy you elite. Yeah, but exactly. The bullpen inherently can't buy you a lead. And that's the problem. I think it's their best attribute is their bullpen. Yeah. Maybe you could count defense because I think largely they've cleaned things up defensively, but that can't buy you a lead either. Like no. the things that inherently are going to matter the most are the rotation because they pitch the most in the offense. I think that might be part of the reason though we see this team play so many close games and they're I mean I know they do get blown out every once in a while but it's the reason they're staying in it because the two things that can make or break your team at least and kill your team they're really good at defense and run prevention from the bullpen and the rotation mostly keeps you in the game so that's part of the reason why I have confidence that I don't think this team's going to fall out of the race at any point and then if you can get a one two week hot stretch from your offense maybe you go on a little bit of a run again and again, but back to the conversation at the beginning, I could say the same thing about the Mets, the Diamondbacks, the Braves. So I'm not going to act like the Cardinals should be the team everyone puts their, their stamps, their flag on right now. But I also don't think it's fair to count them out either. But I do think, to your point earlier, is there a true strength to this team that can carry them? I don't know. But is there a significant weakness that I think I can still see them improving upon at some point in the second half? Yeah, it's the left-handed pitching side of things. Like, can you find a way to not be the 28th ranked offense in all of baseball when the Southpaw is on the mound? Like, it doesn't matter who the left-handed pitcher is. I'm taking that pitcher against the Cardinals offense right now. They could be a single A guy right now. And I'm probably like, I don't know. They might be able to go five and give up one run. Like, so can Goldie can Goldie be a little bit better? Is Nato stuff real? We've asked that question a, a couple of times. Yeah, we, this year? we have, but I think maybe a better question to start asking is, are they going to call up Yvonne Herrera? Like, right. do they go to Thomas to JC? Do they try the Jordan Walker stuff? Because I think we've been pumping the brakes on that stuff for a while, but at this point, if they're serious about making the playoffs, they got to start making some cutthroat decisions here. And at this point, I don't think they can keep finger crossing some of these other things that happen. Like Nolan Gorman, it's really bad right now. And I understand he's been hitting the ball a little bit better lately for outs, but I mean, like he's going to finish with the highest K percentage in, uh, in baseball history Ever. at this rate. Yeah. Like that's horrible. His walk percentage is, I think, below 3% right now. Uh, you look at every like he, and part of his season long numbers are being carried by a week, uh, not not even a week long stretch in early July where he had like a 250 WRC plus, which is and homers for like every day. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like for like, a, yeah, for like literally a week. And then he had like a two and a half week stretch in June where it was really good. But if you take away those two, it's bad across the board. At some point, do you have to pull the plug on that a little bit? Like, I think there's some areas there. I don't know if they're going to make the hard decision, but I would feel better about this team if they did. Yeah, and look, I don't think that even guys like Ollie Marmel is not blind to these things. Yeah, I don't think John Mozeliak is blind to these things. But like, it's easy to say from the outside, like this is what they need to do. Like, look at Nolan Gorman. This is obvious. Everybody with eyes can see that he's you know going to lead Major League Baseball history in K percentage over the course of a full season. Like, he's he's Chris Davis territory, and even a little bit worse in that category right now. So that's extremely notable. But like. When you make that bold decision, it's like you're you're pulling the plug on having a guy who still is like tied for the team lead in home runs, yeah. and you're sending it. So like 
I understand why that's a difficult decision. And it's almost like the sunk cost fallacy a little bit too, because you came in to the year saying like, he has to be one of our big dogs. And I can remember Ollie Marmel. I, I wish I could remember the month if it was kind of May ish area, uh, maybe right before they were able to sort of take off. But in his office before one of the games talking about struggles of the offense, which has been really a theme off and on throughout the season. And basically he kind of throws his hands up a little bit and says, look, if, if guys like Gorman and Nolan and, and, uh, and Goldie aren't in the middle of our lineup hitting doubles and homers, and then he just throws his hands up. Like, what, what am I supposed to say? Yeah. It's not, I can switch guys in the lineup until I'm blue in the face, but if you're only Marmel, if you're the Cardinals, it's hard to get the team result that you thought you were going to have February one, when arguably the three most productive hitters, the guys you thought were going to be one, two, three in importance in your lineup. And maybe Contreras would have snuck above Gorman or whatever. You can debate that. But when those three guys are all underperforming to various levels this season, like it's hard. And then you could say Jordan Walker probably would have been in that top five along with Contreras. And he's not been on the team for the bulk of the season because of how bad he started. So for the Cardinals to be where they are with all of those things being realities is almost kind of amazing and a testament to how well John Mazzalek did fix the pitching. Yeah. Like you, I, I get it. We weren't, maybe we had some questions about really Gibson and Lynn. Is that okay? Sonny Gray. Okay. I could see that. But what's your, what's your sixth starter or seventh? Like what's your depth look like? They've pieced it together. And the bullpen, yep. I think, had a, a, a and all he's talked about this too. There was a specific plan of how they wanted to arrange the bullpen, and it was executed very effectively. And we didn't ever even get to see the full scope of it because Keenan Middleton never pitched. So, like, I think they did a really good job. The front office did an excellent job in the offseason of of turning the pitching from a, a thing that was going to hold you back from even thinking about contending to like it's patched up. It, it might be flex seal tape, you know, it might only be a, a one year fix, but like they did a genuinely good job of being able to put this put this framework together and say, offense, go get them. I, I, Mo didn't think he should have to do much to the offense in the offseason. And when you look at the names on paper and and take yourself out of this moment to go back to the offseason and remember how we felt about a lot of these guys, like, well, there's no real holes in your lineup. You're going to be a pretty good team offensively. And it's not just those five either. Like, I could go down the list and say, like, who would be the sixth most important? Probably Lars Newpar. He's certainly yeah. not at expectations. And it's like, is it, it's getting to kind of conversation about Lars Newpar territory, to be honest with you, because when the Cardinals get these guys that emerge, and it, it, you could look over the course of history, it's Dylan Carlson one year, it's Harrison Bader before that. It's like they'll have these guys, and yet it usually seems to be outfielders, who have the breakout season where they're not all-stars, they're not superstars, but they're doing it at such a young age where you're like, next year, they're going to even take that next. Nolan Gorman is another great example of that from a non-outfielder, where Oh, well, we've got we, we've got this thing made. You know what the present and the future is, and it's guys who are cost controlled, and this is going to be awesome. And hey, one more year like that, we're extending him early. Like that's I think they've had that happen a handful of times with guys. And then the second the follow-up year never really comes. Like that yeah. that next step never really comes, but you're you're stuck because you're going, Well, remember what we thought of him last year. Let's not do anything rash here. We're not gonna trade this guy. We're not gonna, we're not gonna bench this guy, we're not gonna demote this guy to Memphis. But you've got four or five of them. I don't put Donovan in that category because I think he's still doing enough. Um, but the, you know, offensively, you could have seen a next step, and instead he's kind of stagnated around where he had been, or maybe even dropped a little bit in terms of OPS and WRC plus. So from that perspective, it's like it's hard. <laughs> it's hard when you can look one through nine and basically say, I don't know, seven of the guys are underperforming. You've got Contreras, who's performing as expected, and Mason Lynn, who's been above expectations, in my opinion. Um, add Burleson into that because I think people thought of him more as like a fourth outfielder and a, and a good bench bat coming into the year, and now he's a staple. But I think everybody else, I don't know if there's another player that I didn't just name there where you would say offensively that guy has performed uh, above expectations, certainly, and maybe just Donovan has been around at expectations. Guys like Arenado are, are, coming, are coming up, and I look at, uh, I don't know what his WRC plus is, but OPS plus, he's right around 100 right now, yeah. so kind of league average. But what's really interesting about Arenado, and we'll talk about him because there was some good stuff from Eno Saris that comes out about, hey, his bat speed has actually increased over the past few weeks, and is that something that can lead to increased production moving forward? And that got a lot of play yesterday through various media outlets, and for good reason. I mean, Arenado then goes and has a great game last night. Um, it didn't result in a win, but my goodness, the double play between him and Mason Wynn was, I, I don't think you can see a better double play than yeah. that, Josh. It was just really cool. But what do you think about Arenado? I'm looking at you know, the recent numbers uh, since that July 4th kind of cutoff, he's got an 841 OPS. His average has been fine all year, but he's hitting uh, 321 since July 5th and also four homers in that stretch, which is not 
crazy. I mean, that's still only a pace of maybe 20 to 24 homers on the season, but it's it's more than the pace that he had previous to the 4th of July. But also, like, the splits, lefties are giving him more trouble this year, too. It's not, you say, oh, Arnado's turning around. Maybe he can finally crush lefties like he always has. He's got a lower OPS against lefties than he does righties. But if you break it down to starters, he's actually hitting lefty starters a little bit better than he is uh, righty starters. So it's a little bit, uh, lefty relievers is basically, they've, Whatever they're doing, isolated moments to Arenado, he has really struggled specifically against lefty relievers. The OPS is probably down maybe below 600, just doing some quick math in my head. Um, but what's your impression of Arenado? Can he be that thing we're talking about to carry the team, or is it going to have to be a collection of efforts? And then we talk about the roster moves that you mentioned. We'll get into that after we talk Nolan. Is Are there going to need to be some moves? Or can a guy like Arenado be the, 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 the boat that rises and – everybody kind of comes along with him. He's been that guy before in his career. We just haven't seen him or, or really Goldie be that guy for a prolonged stretch in 2024. Yeah, I feel like the amount of sample size we've seen from Nado lately where it's been a lot better than what we've seen at least gives me confidence that he could be the third bat in this lineup behind a Burleson and Contreras. And wherever you want to slot win into that, Win's obviously not going to be a big bat in your lineup, but he's a productive bat in your lineup. I, at the very least, I feel like there's been this narrative around Arnado most of the season where it's like when he comes up to the plate, you don't think he's going to come through, right? You think he's going to be the double play machine. He's going to be end of the whatever rally you have going on. I think Nando is a guy who can contribute in a very positive way the rest of the year. To say that he can carry the team, though, I'm just not ready to go there yet because I think you need the power. And it's just like it's 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 coming a little bit, but it's not that like nato heaters that we've seen where he'll go in june and hit like 12 home runs the whole month or something like that and 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 11 doubles like you know like not all that one month but he can do something like that in a whole month and he just i don't see that right now but this team needs a guy who can pluck a single into center field with the runner on second base and score the run and i i trust nato to come through in spaces like that and i do think you'll see this offense be a lot more productive and again with all the close games they play in a run here and there does matter significantly for this team. It doesn't matter as much when you're playing these these big games or giving up eight runs, seven runs. It's like, okay, the, the RBI single there didn't make as much of a difference. But if uh, if a guy like Nato comes through in more spaces down the stretch with a runner in second, runner in third, those that will swing games for the Cardinals. So I do think at the very least, maybe people should pump the brakes on the like I think we we just did a tier ranking of where we thought players are at this point of season. We put Nato in D tier as the overall. And I think overall. If you're giving him a grade for the year, it's at least a D. Like it's it's at, at best it's a D to me. But the rest of the way, can I see him being again? I, it's hard because you have the expectations of who Nolan or Arnado is supposed to be in your head, and so it's like he's not going to be that. But can he be what we expected? Maybe Nolan Gorman's bat to be not the exact power, but like that third bat in the lineup, fourth bat in the lineup. I feel like Wilson Contreras and Burleson are the two big guys now. Except again, Burleson's been struggling lately. Yeah, Contreras hasn't been himself either. So like. Are you going to have a Nato rising while those guys are falling? I think you guys, you need those guys to sustain it a little bit. But I guess I personally haven't seen enough to be like Nato can carry this offense down the stretch, but give it a few more weeks or add some more power to the game. And maybe I changed my opinion on that. But I think I've just been so burned by like that random Nato game against Washington or the Reds where it's like, oh, he's back. And then, nah. But with Goldie, Whenever you've seen him get hot, it feels like he goes into these 0 for 15s and he just kind of falls off again. I don't think Nato's going to do that. I think he's at yeah. least a productive part of this lineup now. It's just I don't I don't trust the ceiling yet. Yeah, I think that's fair because the ceiling comes with power. And we even over the stretch where I'm going to I'm going to read off his batting line. It's really good um, since July 5th. He's only had the four home runs, which, again, is an increase compared to what it had been previously. But we're still kind of looking for that next year that we're used to seeing from him where he's just, you know, every few games he pulls a, a line shot that goes over the wall. But since July 5th, if I told you, like, this would be our not of the rest of the year, it wouldn't carry them. But he would be more than doing his part with a 321 average, a 373 on base, a 468 slug, which equates to an 841 OPS. Oh, yeah. Like, if he gives you that the rest of the year, that's not you know, Nolan Gorman's hot week carrying you with a crazy, you know, just crazy uh, video game numbers. But I think that's Nolan Arenado doing his part. Yes. If doing his part is all you're going to get from him, and, and let's say Burley and, and Contreras do sustain their season-long numbers, even though they're kind of dipping right now, you still probably do have to consider the idea of roster moves to potentially help your lineup be better against lefties. And, and there are right-handed bats in the minors that could potentially be called upon to help you. What are the moves that you would be looking at the most? Because I know a popular one is people talking about, well, 
if they're not throwing out base runners anyway, what's the difference between Herrera and Pajes? Um, Pajes' bat has not been as bad as people think, but there's really no power there. Herrera is the better hitter. I'm not trying to dispute that. Um, but but the reasoning given to have that swap in the first place was, well, Pajes is better behind the plate and he's going to manage the run game a little bit better, which I still believe is the case. However, I think if you could snap your fingers and change one kind of little minutia detail about this Cardinals team this year, it would be the fact that they're not holding runners, especially in the bullpen. They're just not holding runners. And it's it's been a huge kind of sore spot for this this team. And the teams that come into town and notice it, you're going to see right away in game one of that series because they just run run like crazy. Again, it's easier to steal bases than it ever was because bigger bases and rules on disengagements like that might not have a huge impact. But it, it still is a thing that the teams that I think are most effectively capturing the rule set are certainly going to do it against the Cardinals right now because I, I don't think there's a lot Contreras or Pajas can really do in some of these moments where they're they're just letting guys go through the turnstile. Um, but is is it a Herrera question that you think maybe he's a guy to have up? Would you have him up with Pajas? And, you know, just have him as sort of a DH slash bench bat for uh, or, or a guy that could come in against left handed pitching uh, is to JC on the radar for you, because obviously he's not on the 40 man, but there are ways to massage that um, to JC could play second base. If you're going to press the big red Nolan Gorman button, then that would be a thing that I think would make a lot of sense. Um, it's a bold button to press. But like you said, there's no spite in this. And when you get to the end of the year and if you miss by two and a half games, I guess two, two or three games from the playoffs and you didn't say let's make the bold move that you know risk it for the biscuit like if you don't do that then do you live to regret it because maybe you could have gotten more production from somebody else and then obviously there's jordan walker down there and and where he might fit i guess is a question but kind of go on that who stands out to you and and if you were in charge king of the world what are the roster moves you would consider today to try and get the cardinals in a better spot against left-handed pitching because as you mentioned they've been okay against righties what could they do against lefties to improve how would you adjust the roster uh, realistically, which I know you will be realistic uh, to try to make that happen? I guess it, it kind of depends on how urgent they are, right? Because I I still doubt they're going to DFA Crawford or Carpenter. Carpenter, I don't really. I think he's been productive and helpful. Numbers so I, been, I don't. Yeah. He's filled yeah. his role. Like yeah, being honest with you, his his numbers are fine. I don't have an issue with Carp. So I, that's one move. I'm like, I don't think you're going to do. So, but if I were in the role at this point, I think. If I'm not going to be sending down Gorm, if I want to keep the potential that he can somehow figure it out, I do need to have him playing less. And I think it makes sense that Thomas and JC can play against left-handed pitching. Just see what happens against se- and second base, left-handed pitching. Thomas and JC fills in there. That's a DFA Crawford role for me, where so JC could be your backup shortstop. Figure things out. I, it's risky. I'm not. I'm not going to act like so JC can come up and he look like Mason Wynn did last year, right? Or he can look like what Victor Scott did at the beginning of this year. So well, it's like not, Brandon Crawford does this year. Oh, yeah, no. or Brandon Crawford. But like, well, but to your point, oh no, it's like, well, you already had Brandon Crawford, so you're not necessarily getting rid of a guy who is super productive, anyways. That's an easy move for me that I think just makes a lot of sense if they have the urgency that we just need to do whatever it takes to make the playoffs and we got to make some hard decisions. And honestly, if at this point they can't handle losing one of their veteran leaders, I think that's a huge indictment on some of the other veterans in the clubhouse. Like it's not a business a, move. If they were to yeah. do it, and look, they love Crawford and like I think Crawford's great, right? But it is a where it's August 9th. Yeah. And what what utility are you getting from that role? It, they need it, they need a even if it was a right-handed Brandon Crawford, he's a lot more valuable to this team because he's probably better with splits against lefties than he is. That yeah. they needed a righty for that role, and they feel, I guess, kind of stuck. But they also they don't have an issue with Brandon Crawford and the way he contributes to the team, and that's fine. But that could be an example of maybe not having a lot of urgency. I see how fans like I see both sides. I see where the clubhouse is like, no, like Crawford's one of our guys. Like, why would we want to? But it's like, c- could you imagine a world where you're getting more out of that role? And is that person potentially named Thomas to JC, which is like. You know, I, before they even got Crawford and we were kind of looking in spring, I was trying to figure out, like, what what's that spot going to look like if Tommy Edmond doesn't, you know, get it rolling here? And obviously he never did health wise. And I wrote about, you know, like they want a spring training like Thomas and JC should play a little shortstop because you just I, I know they probably consider him a prospect and they don't want him to be relegated to a bench role. But you could see the fit on a team that was kind of shaping out to be pretty left handed heavy. I don't I don't hate this the JC idea. I don't think the Cardinals do either. It's just a it's a hard thing. And I think, honestly, it might be. This sounds a little crazy. It might be easier for them to do it with Gorman instead of Brandon Crawford because he needs some at-bats anyway. If the manager doesn't trust right now that Gorman can fill the role he's needed to fill, that's got to be seen from on high. Like, Moe's got to be looking down and going, yeah, I guess he's not really in the lineup very often, is he? Like, look, Gorman could tonight go and hit two home runs if he's in the lineup. Like, that could happen, and that's the 
the risk in sending him down. But if at a certain point, you just have to make a decision with your chest. And that's not an only decision. That's got to be a Mo decision if they're yeah. going to do it. But that's easier than DFA and Crawford potentially. Um, but also, is it really because Crawford is exactly the 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 fit that Sajasi could be because he could play a little shortstop and he's a right-handed bat. So I, I get why it might be an easier thing to do it with Gorman. And there could be some upside to doing that as well, getting him some reps. But also with Crawford, it's like, that's a one for one move that you probably got better as a team on the field. What are what are the intangibles worth? I, I'm not trying to pretend they don't matter because I know within that clubhouse that that's not something that anybody would say um, because I, I and I think it's genuine. They they like Brandon Crawford. That's good. But is there some value and utility for a team that is scraping and clawing for every win they can get to the manager being able to like if I'm only marble and like he, he would never say it. But if I'm only marble, it's like, dude, it'd be nice to have a, 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 a JC esque bat. If he's going to OPS even 700 as a guy who can hit some lefties for us and be a be, you know, defensively, could he be better than Crawford? I don't know. Crawford is, you know, limited at this stage of his career defensively, but he's got a wealth of experience at shortstop. So how do you kind of balance that out for a guy who's mostly a second baseman, you know, third baseman type in so JC, but who could play a little bit of shortstop? It's it's definitely valid. So, all right, I've talked enough about that. Let me know what your thoughts on uh, the others are. Herrera, Walker, and I guess if you wanted to get into the Luke and Baker side of things, you could. Guy's got 30 homers in AAA. It's, he's on the 40, man, but I also see where they've got Carp, and that's probably the answer to that question. Yeah, I think unless they were going to make a bold decision on Carpenter, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me positionally, fit wise. Like how, I mean, basically, he just became, becomes the right handed bat off the bench, which again is valuable, but I just think there's more versatility with some of the other guys. And I mean, I just, I'll, I'll, I'll stop with the crowd. On the IL, by the way. If for whatever reason, I'm not suggesting they should do it as like a sneaky, haha, you're yeah. hurt. I, I, I am always, I'm, I'm going down with the ship on Paul Goldschmidt. I just need yeah. it. Kind of like what I felt like with Wainwright last year. I said, you're going to let him start, especially in this year. I'm going down with the ship. I'm not going to yeah. be, but if Goldie happened to land on the IL, I think Luke and Baker is probably the move. And then you just, you, you, you platoon him with Burleson at first, yeah. but that's, that's another story. You see what happens, but unless something like that happens or like if Burleson went down, like if some, if there's a weird positional fit thing, but right now it doesn't make sense roster construction wise to me. Uh, the other thing. So or back to that original point of sending down Crawford, that's if you don't want to do the Gorm thing for me, the most, the thing that makes the most sense is you send down Gorm because they clearly don't trust him as at least as much as they used to. They're not, I guess he started the last two games, but he had kind of sat for a little bit. sounds like maybe he was working some mechanical stuff, trying to get back into a group. But I mean, Short sample size, it hasn't really worked out so far. To your point, you want a guy like that playing every day. You don't want him not playing at all. You don't want to just put him on the bench and say, hey, randomly, we're going to put you in a pinch hit opportunity here or there, random spot starts and That's see tough. if you can figure it out. Like, go to Memphis and, put, and pitch that to him. It's like, hey, it's been a rough year, and we believe in you. We want you to play every day, and if you start hitting, we're going to call you right back up. It's kind of that Jordan Walker thing where there's stuff for him to work on, but it's also like, hey, Walker, if you produce, you're up here. You're not producing, you're not up here. And and same with the Crawford side of things. Like if the if the clubhouse can't accept not having Crawford in it, I would if I'm Mosaic, look at all the young players and the veterans and say, then why aren't you producing? Like if you want a guy like this here, you haven't been producing. We have to make this team better. It's about the club. It's not about your individuals here. So I just think there's some hard conversations that have to happen. If they don't do that, then what you're really stamping and your the rest of your season on is we believe Gorm's gonna be better. We believe Goldie's gonna be better. We believe Nato's gonna be better. Could that happen? Yes, but It'll look really tough if you go, if they kind of stay, stamp their flag into that now, the rest of the year doesn't play out. And it's like, hey, you've had every opportunity this year to cut a Crawford, cut a Carpenter, cut some of these other guys and maximize some roster space, but you just kept rolling with your guys and it didn't work out. Preseason, all the way through June, I don't blame them, right? I think at some, I believed going into this year, it's the top 10 offense. I believe that they will figure it out at some point, but we are in the middle, we're close to the middle of August at this point. And at this point, you kind of just have to do what's best for the club. So, um, I do think the other move would be Yvonne Herrera for Pedro Pajes because just to try something at this point, the offense, I think to your point too, like I think Pajes is better than people give him credit for, but I do think the potential of Herrera's bat back in that lineup. And then I do think calling games wise, framing wise, Pajes clearly gives you an upgrade over Herrera, but at least from the, uh, stopping the running game, there's been real issues there and it makes me, it makes me look more and more at what the bullpen and the starters are doing to hold runners versus, like maybe it wasn't I, clearly Yvonne Herrera's arm isn't good enough, but maybe it wasn't actually as much his fault as was some of these other guys. And then same with Pajes right now. I, he doesn't look like a guy who can't control the run game behind the play. It just seems like, well, these guys are getting great jumps on 
Kittredge or whoever it is right now. So um, I think the two clearest moves to me is you either send down Gorm or DFA Crawford and you bring up to JC and see what happens. And then you do the Pahis for Herrera thing. Or you could do, if you wanted to, have carry the three catchers and send down Gorm. Um, I would be interested in that. I just think at this point it's so bad that I would rather do everything I can to try and upgrade the, this offense. And this isn't a fair comparison, but look at the upgrade that Tom, again, Tom, short sample size. But even if Tommy Pham was just league average right now compared to what they got from Dylan Carlson, you would feel that impact right now. So if you can get any kind of upgrade over that Carpenter spot, or not Carpenter spot, Crawford spot, I think this club would feel in a real way. And again, back to that Nato conversation earlier, the, the games are the slimmest of margins that a base hit here in a big spot, a base hit there actually swings games for this club in a way that maybe it doesn't for other teams that I think they have to be looking at the margins where they just, their margin for error is so thin that they have to take advantage of everything they can. And I think positionally right now, there's a lot of spots in this roster that they are not maximizing. And and one of the guys too, that I think is going to be interesting to watch over this coming stretch is Victor Scott, because yeah. he's, you know, he's got a roster spot because of his defense and he's probably going to play very frequently because of it. I just don't think, New Bar can handle center field the way the Cardinals want, especially knowing that like you probably got a gold glover to one side with Donovan playing there for the most part. But if he's needed at second, you're talking about, yeah, we need to get Jordan Walker back in here because I think offensively I've seen enough to be like, ah, let's see what Wa Walker could come back. He could come back today and I would I would support it if, if you find a spot to put him. But that almost would be like the commitment to trusting New Bar in center. And then it's like Walker to one side, Burleson to the other. Like if you're going to do all of these things at once, that could leave you like – but Victor Scott's also looking a little bit better offensively, but let's not go too crazy with it. It's been a very small sample, but in 14 at bats, he's three for 14. He hit the home run. It's a 214 average of 643 OPS in this very small sample that he's been back. But if he's in the Siani role, that's just fine. If he's producing similarly offensively to Siani, like you can certainly live with that. But like if you really wanted to go crazy, it's I view it this way. Think about next year's team. What would you change? What do you think changes offensively? Well, I think Goldie probably walks. I, I know that there was reported that there's going to be a conversation. Of course there will. They would be heartless to not have a conversation about what that could look like. But I think at the end of the day, it's a very hard thing to tell a guy who's been your MVP and your middle order bat for so many years that now you're in the Matt Carpenter role without actually leaving for a couple of years before coming back like Matt Carpenter did. It would be almost akin, and Carpenter was really bad before he left, but it would be kind of similar to that where it's like, you've been used to being this middle order presence and you're the guy, you're the team MVP. And now you're not leaving, but, but after you come back to Jupiter for next year, you're going to be a bench bat. You're going to be a platoon guy. Like I don't, I just think from the personhood side of it, it's, that's a hard thing to do with Paul Goldschmidt. So I think he probably walks. I think Carp probably goes, I think Crawford probably goes. And then it's like, so JC Herrera, maybe, you know, has a battle with Pajas, whatever that looks like. Those guys are both on your bench and they're up. Walker is obviously up in one of those spots. Burleson playing more first base. And then we have a, a question, you know, I think Siani in the Victor spot until Victor continues to season more. Maybe Victor's ready. We'll see. And then but like all these moves that I think I'm talking about are internal things that could happen today if he really wanted them to. And it's like, yeah, that, that bench actually works pretty good. But there's this like pull, magnetic pull of like, well, you can't, you can't make these moves today. It's interesting. If we knew right now that the Cardinals, like if you had a crystal ball and you say the Cardinals are going to win 83 games and they're going to miss the playoffs by three, and you're like, oh man, that stinks. What would you do differently today if you had that knowledge? It's like you'd probably pull out all the stops because you're realizing how close you might be. And it's it's intangibles versus the the just the bloodthirst for cutting players and saying, do the maximize the roster in every possible way for for platoon advantages. And like we think about the game in, in those terms so often, and yet you know, we're, we're, we're kind of looking at some of these guys on the bench going, well, they provide value. There are things that they do behind the scenes that people don't really recognize. And I'm not disputing that, but it's interesting to wonder, like if you knew for sure that the path they're on would be one that leaves them just short, would they do things differently? Um, because you're only going to get one chance at this. And then once it's over, you, you know, your, your chosen path will lead you to a result and we'll see what that ends up being. Uh, but that, yeah, it's very interesting because I could make the case for a lot of the roster moves we talked about. I don't think I would do all of them today. Um, and then September call-ups, it gets a lot easier. That's why I True. think within the next week or so, if you don't see a real turnaround from Gorman, it would be a perfect time to send him, get everyday ABs in Memphis and say, September 1, you're back. I mean, it's I will guarantee it. It's not a roster thing at that point. You're just back, and there's a lot of value to, to you being here. Kind of wish it was like the old days where you could bring up the whole 40-man roster instead of just go up to 28. But, uh, you know, G Gorman comes back. It's, it's a no-brainer at that point. I think this could be a, a nice little spell to maybe do that if they're not feeling 
supremely confident what he's going to be able to do in in the days and weeks ahead without such a stint. But it's interesting. I I, I think those there those are conversations that uh, are are difficult. I'm not going to say that they're they're not. Whether it's sending a guy down or, or taking a guy that's been with you all year and and saying you're not on the team anymore. Um, I don't think that John Mozeliak has any appetite to do to do either of those things. He he would like to have the roster just work as he designed it and and everything's great. Um, but is there a point where they have to try to pull out all the stops? You know, we'll see. I think it could be interesting. And to kind of lead into our final topic is kind of a roster shakeup midseason, which, again, I want to make it clear. I don't think it's imminent. I think the Gorman thing could happen soon. Yeah. But everything else is just, you know, I I don't know what the appetite is to do something that's going to take somebody who is a full time member of the team and say you're a DFA, you're cut, something like that. Agreed. And I threw that stuff out earlier. Is like I think that's stuff I would potentially be considering today, but I just don't see them doing that at Crawford. Fans are talking about it, but it would be it would be a surprise. Like w- let's say the world in which it happens, we're going. Well, yeah, no duh. Once it happens, you're like, well, sure. But until it happens, you're like, I really don't think they're going to do that. I don't think yeah. that's the way they operate, and I that's my impression as well. But based on all this. Cardinals fans right now, there's a lot of talk about like attendance is they're announcing numbers that are as low as they've announced outside of the, the COVID impacted years. Um, I don't think they'll ever announce lower than 30,000. They'll find a way to finagle. <laughs> like it's just that, that would be a, a, a rough look this season. I just don't think that'll happen because if, you know, season tickets have been sold, all, all those things. I think 30,000 is going to be kind of the, the, the bare stone minimum. But people are talking about like, what could it be that would bring the excitement back to this team for the fan base? What's going to get the ballpark filled again? Is there something in mind? Like, I don't even know if a few fun little roster moves are going to be, you know, what sending Nolan Gorman away is going to bring you back. I mean, he's the guy that could bring him in if he starts hitting. What yeah. What is your thought on that narrative and conversation, though, about the ballpark? The excitement is kind of I even told you before we started the show, I'm like, yeah, nobody's going to watch this because like, I did my podcast last night, my B-Shave Daily. And, you know, views are down because people are like, oh, that was the kind of game that I just don't even want to hear. Re- rehashed because I if, if I wanted to be angry about it I could be but in reality I'm, I'm reasonable enough to know that you know they played pretty well and they lost it happens sometimes the circumstances were stacked against them but like right now it does feel like interest sort of wanes in moments like this what could be the thing that brings it back and you can answer that in the context of this year or like long term as, as we think forward to 2025 as well just uh, dealer's choice yeah, All right, I'll just quickly answer this here because I don't think there's a lot they can do other than just win. Like if they're winning and they're in the race and they look like a fun competitive team, I think they'll. I'm mean, not going to sell out games. I don't think unless it's a really huge game and people want to get out there on a Friday, Saturday. But I think you could see an attendance jump a little bit, but not like not to what we expect the Cardinals to be. Typically, I do think the thing that they're battling the most right now, and it's not just because I think people want to pin it on its ownership's inability to, or lack of spending to the tier that people want it to. And it's the mosaic stuff. Like I think that contributes to it, but I think the biggest issues that are facing them is one attendance around the game is down. Just interest in baseball is not the same as it used to be. And I mean, for even as bad as things are this year, and maybe next year is the year we see a really plummet for them. So maybe this is a little bit too early to say it's still pretty uh, relative to the rest of the league, pretty consistent. But for as bad as people say the attendance is right now, I, I don't really know where the best place to look for attendance metrics are for teams like this. But I mean, they're still around sixth in baseball in attendance, right? And the teams that they're behind, it's the Dodgers, the Yankees, the Phillies, the Padres, and the Braves. Like, I'm not freaking out about where the Cardinals attendance is compared to the rest of the league. But again, when you're in a mid market like this and you're not getting the same revenue cash flows, at least at what they'll say is the Dodgers and Yankees, you do rely on attendance more maybe than those teams would. Um, so I think it's a big deal, but I think you go back to just baseball interest and in, is down in general. And I think this RSN and blackouts thing has just been such a huge L for the game of baseball for the Cardinals. And that I just think there's probably a lot of people that, if this stuff had been figured out five, 10 years ago, that you would have maintained the interest of some family or of some adults and then their kids and their kids would be watching games when you go to games. But now you have generations of kids that have never really watched a baseball game at home before. So they just don't really care the same as their parents did. And so now they don't want to go to the games either. And then I'm not incentivized to bring my family because I don't want to spend hundreds of dollars to do that either. Like, sure, I'd go on my own, but like, do I want to take three kids to go to the ballpark? Maybe not. I think there's some bigger things that are not necessarily just player performance wise, team performance wise. But then you also bake that in. It's a it's a significant piece of the pie, but I just don't think it's the full piece of the pie for the Cardinals. And so I don't think there's a near term fix. I think there's in my head, there's two routes that the DeWitts could go with this. It's either they they um, kind of um, sometimes like in businesses, you 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 will 
invest in things because you saw the fruit already. And so it's like, hey, the fans come back to the ballpark when we start investing into this team again. And so maybe they just kind of wait it out and see, hey, if the RSN stuff gets like whatever the new TV stuff looks like, it's figured out. Maybe there's reinvigorated interest in the game. Our attendance goes back up. We start playing incrementally better. We'll we'll start investing in this team again. Or they go and say, hey, we're going to take some let's take some financial losses in these next few years, assuming that if we do that, it'll bring interest back. But I don't know if they're going to do that because I think they see all these other bigger factors, too, that I think we all want to say it wouldn't matter. But I I know the pool hole stuff brought people back to the ballpark, but I mean, I think someone, I think uh, Derek Gould joked about it in his chat. He's like, if they sign Juan Soto this off season, are people really going to come back to the ballpark? Like we, they used to, I think no. Cause I think pretty quickly there people will complain about the starting pitching and then they'll complain about the manager. And I think there's a lot of external factors that people say at, or team factors that people say are the real reasons, but it's actually these bigger external factors that the Cardinals can't necessarily control themselves and com combined with their, mediocrity the last few years that hasn't helped right i think it's the worst timing for them to have been through the stretch of kind of falling apart that if they were more of the early 2010s cardinals or the 2004 2005 cardinals 2006 cardinals maybe they could have uh sustained through this but they aren't and so i think it's like the perfect storm of bigger mlb issues combining with their decline at the same time that's kind of put them in a spot where i don't know if there's an a quick fix. I think it's going to take five to 10 years to really get back to where they need to be. Yeah. I think having that like exciting brand of Cardinals teams, if that was the product you were seeing right now, the Cardinals as an organization would be able to overcome a lot of the external factors because they, I, I just have a belief that it would have been the case, but you're right with the downturn coinciding with some external things. And look, it is harder than ever to watch these games. Sometimes not harder than ever. They used to not be on TV, but yeah. like in recent memory for people of this generation, like it, it, it can be kind of a deterrent where people are like, I what's what app do I have to get if I can even get it in the first place? Like there are definitely a lot of folks who who have just kind of tuned out because it's not the the product isn't to the point that they are they're they're got the FOMO. They almost feel like it's better for their mental health sometimes because they're not having to, to stress about, you know, the Cardinals and, and what's going on for a team that they don't see really going anywhere so yeah. all of those factors combining I, I do think there are questions about maybe the direction of spending and, and what that could look like in, in the years to come um i do think though if if this team were priming for an october run and everybody could feel and sense that it was was going to be on the way then the, the excitement would still be kind of to normal levels um but when you have a team that just it doesn't give people that vibe right now it is very difficult i think for especially as you mentioned families to overcome those external factors um, and, and, and still have that same level of support for Cardinals baseball. And I do think it's going to cause, you know, a dip to payroll at some point if it if it is something that continues where ownership, it, for better or worse, they're going to look at it and say, yeah, we can't really, you know, we're not going to we're not going to take the losses on this. We just have to, you know, operate and trim revenue and again or trim the, the, the expenses if the revenue is down. And again, I still draw the line to Bloom being a guy that had to do that in Tampa, had to do it in Boston. And I, I think the ownership in St. Louis is going to react very differently than Boston's did because yep. Boston's kind of told Heimbloom, you have, you have to do it this way. And then when he did and they didn't have the success, they're like, what's the matter with you? Uh, somebody's got to be the, the fall guy for this. I think Bill DeWitt, you know, and Cardinals fans might not love it, but I think this ownership group would be understanding of put, you know, be effective. We'll, we'll have to kind of get back to our roots of player development. And if we can, if we can make that happen and still, you know, be in the mix at least each each year, most years, that's going to be enough for us because it's going to work with our, our our matrix on you know expenses and revenue. But we'll see. It's definitely, I mean, it's un unavoidable and undeniable at this point that interest is is down at the moment. But again, I think even a a seventeen in a row like you had in twenty one down the stretch, that's all it might take for this this Fair. fan base to really buy back in. Um, but is that coming from this version of the Cardinals? You know, probably not. Any kind of final thoughts on that? Do, well, I have a question for you. Do you think sure. this offseason, like if if Mosaic, I, I've heard it from a few people now that maybe this offseason is offseason where the transition happens. If Bloom is the guy this offseason, do you think even just like a change in leadership, even if he has to cut payroll a little bit, I don't think like he's not having to trade a Mookie Betts in his prime to do that. He's not having to offload salary of David Price in that same deal too. Like it's probably more of, Hey, we're just maybe not adding a significant. We're just not really going to add much. It's probably gonna be the same roster, but do you, I think I've heard some people say until Mo's gone, I'm not really going to be interested in this team anymore. Do you think if there's a leadership change this off season, that will help boost ballpark attendance, even if there isn't really much roster turnover in an exciting way, like it's losing Goldschmidt and it's adding maybe a reliever and maybe a veteran starter. That's not super exciting. Like, 
will the fact that there's just a leadership change actually change fan interest? If there was one this offseason, which I'm not convinced there will be, like most contract goes through 25, I thought initially in February of 23 when he said, this is my last contract, I'm going to start to usher out of this role. I thought by now, um, by the end of the season at that point, that there would be sort of a, he would he would kind of go this, the David Stearns route for the 2025 like he did with the Brewers and kind of like, I'm still here, but I'm not running the day-to-day. I thought there would have been a transition after 24. But when 23 went so bad, it was like all hands on deck to fix it. Now we'll kind of see where we are. Um, it could go either way on that. I do think Bloom is primed to be the successor. I, I mean, I'm, I'm not... I said it in, in when they first hired him and, you know, there were people that would push back like, well, that's not, you know, he didn't, he didn't do the whole, you know, I joke with the cat about it and the cat understands very well what, what things are happening behind the scenes. And like, maybe it was overhyped what Heim Bloom had as far as an impact on their off season. Um, but you, I do think that there's a thought to, especially when you combine it with his experience doing more with less in terms of payroll. Um, I do think that he would be somebody that would be a big fit. Uh, and a good fit that ownership would would appreciate that that skill set that he's carried from the places he's been. But uh, whether it happens now or happens a, a year after 2025, I don't think just simply changing leadership is going to ignite the fan base. No, because they could. And look, I know a lot of people don't like Ollie Marmel. I I think people have have kind of overblown that criticism, but that's another story. But they could this offseason say we're dismissing Ollie Marmel, we're bringing in this other manager. Uh, it almost doesn't matter who it is, and we're going to move to Heim Bloom. And, and, and Mosaic's going to fade into the, the into the background. That alone, by the time you get to April 15th, 2025, people are going to hate the new manager and they're going to hate Hein Bloom if the Cardinals are, you know, middling around 500 or below. It doesn't matter who it is. Winning will be the thing that gets people yeah. excited. There's a the select few names in baseball that they could bring in via trade or via free agency that would do it. Um, like, would Juan Soto do it? There'd be a bump for sure. People would, you would feel it at spring training like you would, but that's not coming. They're not adding that kind of payroll. They're not, they're just not going to add a superstar in the offseason. I'd be shocked. So that being said, no, I don't think just, oh, finally we're, we're rid of Mo. It, people are going to be, it's going to be like a be careful what you wish for sort of thing. If the, the edict on a new regime is can't spend as much money and they're middling around 500 next June, it's like, well, you can't say it's Mo's fault anymore. And I don't think they're, I think Ollie's going to be back. I don't think that's even in question. And so it's like, you can't, but if they did make a change, it's like, we well, can't blame the manager. You, you wanted a different manager. So no, I think winning is the, yeah. is the answer. And winning is going to be harder to come by if the Cardinals ultimately have to spend less and have to, you know, kind of tiptoe around this TV deal and things like that. But it's interesting to see. And, and look, the winning could happen. They could win their next 10 games. And I think suddenly I, that would be enough for people to get reinvested because I think that at that point you'd say, yeah, they're probably making the playoffs and people would be, like, oh, they, who's pitching tonight? Like, oh, Sonny, we're going to go. Like, people would get back into it if they win. I really think it's it, – it, the Cardinal fan base is significant enough that winning could cure the external angst that happens, the the, the financial, the economical. Because, frankly, tickets are not expensive. You could go I, – I just did it on Monday. Uh, you know, I think I used the secondary market, but you, you could get a ticket for less than $10. Now, parking, you have to kind of be creative maybe to be able to park affordably because that's certainly gone up and – and, you know, ballpark expenses and concessions and everything. It's a tough thing for families for sure. But, yeah, I, I mean, I think it becomes a destinational thing again if they start winning. And that's really the long and short of it. All right. Well, we've gone pretty long. You got any thoughts? Yeah. Any, any any plug us for the, for dealing the cards because I forgot to do that at the beginning. Make sure <laughs> to subscribe to dealing the cards and everything that Josh uh, does with that crew. Um, but what do you guys have coming up? Anything new that you want to mention for people who may not be familiar with your, your all's podcast? Oh, yeah, we go live on Sundays and Wednesdays. So it's it's fun because we do the live chat so people can interact and we have some fun conversation with the chat as we're going through as well. So, yeah, next episode will be Sunday afternoon. Uh, weird Sunday off day. I don't like those. So that's going to be because, uh, right, they play today and then Saturday, right, against the Royals or do they have the off day? That's right. It's Sunday yeah. off. going to be kind of yeah. strange. I don't, know, so, I don't know how we handle that, but that's yeah. what's coming. So come on a live stream and talk with us about how there's no baseball because it's weird. But um, yeah, so hopefully there's some better baseball down the stretch for us to talk about. Otherwise, we might be having a lot of Heim Bloom conversations the rest of the year. Who knows? So um, yeah, I do. I'm interested, though, like just to tie a bow on that, that I you saw with like a team like the Royals this offseason. I don't think you have to go. I mean, I know actually they spend a lot, but their payroll isn't huge, right? Like I do think there's enough That's young. Smart. Yes. It's always about getting the right guys when you get Seth Lugo was a, I mean, unbelievable yeah. signing. I mean, that's when you get a guy like that and you nail that signing, tends to help. 
So I am curious if like a if a Hein Bloom was in charge, if there's some moves that aren't going to excite people, but that pan out a lot better than what I mean this year. I think Mo's done about as much as he could have with what he did, but maybe there could be some excitement with that. But then also like if walk like there's a lot of if names that not all of them at the panel, but like if Newbar is the guy you thought he could be, if Walker Gorman, do Tank and Quinn make an ma- impact at some point? Is to JC someone like I think there's a lot of in internal improvements that could happen in 2025 especially offensively you haven't seen this year that you don't necessarily have to make it i'm not advocating they shouldn't make changes but i can see a world where this club is a is a lot more exciting this year but looks a lot a lot lot like the club it does right now minus crawford and and carpenter and lance lynn types but yep we'll be live on sunday wednesday so um join us for that and obviously check out uh philosophical differences and everything brendan's got going on on the daily so you you really have been on the daily grind this year it's been impressive it's been and sometimes multiple times a day yeah yeah, it's been absolutely miserable, but uh, I think worth it in terms of what I'm trying to do. And honestly, you mentioned your guys' live streams, and I just did. Um, uh, I had been using some outside software. I, I used StreamYard last night for a live stream just to kind of check it out and see. And maybe that's something that for this we'll do one of these one of these Fridays is do it yeah. live. Maybe try to incentivize YouTube membership, something like that, to you know say it's a members live stream, but everybody can watch the podcast later. Just some some different things. We're always trying to be creative because you know we're. Uh, and you guys work hard and putting out, I know you guys really get a lot of joy out of it from a, you know, just being fans and being able to um, kind of interact with Cardinals fans. And that's, uh, believe me, I get a lot of joy out of that too, but just trying to come up with creative things to do content wise is, is always part of the game. So if people would be interested in seeing this show live, start claiming for that. Maybe it's something we could do at some point because it doesn't really change very much for us. Like we're doing, we're doing this all in one take anyway. We just have to cross our fingers and hope that we get the, uh, the, the, the technology to work out in our favor, which I think for the most part today, it did. So, uh, Josh, thanks for joining me, man. It's been a fun hour, yeah. and uh, we'll we'll see you right back here next Friday. Check out Dealing the Cards. You can follow them on YouTube and all the podcast apps as well. Uh, be, shape, uh, be Shape Daily you can find on Spotify and Apple Podcasts as well as subscribing to this YouTube channel. And by the way, check out the Discord. It's free. Be Shape Daily Discord. It's been a lot of fun with Cardinals fans talking in there. All right, that'll do it for this edition of Philosophical Differences. Thank you all for joining, and we'll talk to you next time on the show. Peace.